Dr. Mukesh Batra to come up on stage, please. Well, uh, I don't feel the need to introduce uh, Dr. Mukesh Batra. All uh, definitely, definitely know him. He has been a historical figure in his line of activity. You know, homeopathy is a guy who is known internationally, operates locally as well as internationally. So we are going to have some very interesting interactions today. What we are going to discuss is not his line of business, but how he does the business. So we are going to talk to Dr. Mukesh Batra as an entrepreneur, not as a doctor. I hope you are good with that. <laughs> so shall we begin? Okay. 1982, you began. What is entrepreneurship as a word to you, Dr. Patra? Well, I actually began in 74. And between 74 and 82, I was, you know, working like any other doctor in a polyclinic. 82, I started my first entrepreneurship and branded clinic. For me, entrepreneurship is a lot about risk taking. It's a lot about belief in yourself. And uh, I think when you have belief in yourself and you combine it with risk taking, I think you automatically become an entrepreneur. So you have enjoyed the journey. What is that one learning that you would like to share with us with, before we begin the session as an entrepreneur? Uh, your journey for the last 40 years, approximately 40 years. Well, my one lesson always is that, uh, you know, well, they always say, and we tell our people as well, you know, get it first time right, but in life it never happens that way. And so I would say always that get it second time right. And a lot of us, as long as we learn how to do that, uh, it's a lesson for us to learn. Because I think in everything in my life as well, uh, I first come across failure. And then after failure, you get success. And I think people who don't try hard enough are people who actually fail. And people who actually perceive and persevere are people who actually succeed. You know, they say perseverance is the key to success. And I just like to quote a little Urdu couplet. Kadam chum leti hai manzil yaakar. Kadam chum leti hai manzil yaakar. Agar rahi khud apni himmat na hare. And I think a lot of us turn failures because at some stage or the other, we give up. Fantastic. Uh, Dr. Batra, you are in a line of activity where in 1982, homeopathy was not a very great recognized uh, sector to work in. In fact, the government themselves had a lot of uh, different kind of perceptions about the activity. So I think you're the best known brand in the whole world. If I'm not wrong, around 85 countries in the world uh, practice homeopathy. Right, yeah. And you're the one of the most known brands for this line of activity. So what was the challenges that you faced in 1980s and how did you overcome those challenges? Convincing the government authorities and the public at large that homeopathy is a very good format of treatment which can be definitely long lasting. Well, I didn't convince the government at all. I think the government convinced itself. So I had no role to play in that at all. Even though I've been an advisor to the government for a few years, but uh, I think it's an advice that, you know, good advice sometimes people don't always take. So let me leave it at that. But I think, uh, you know, awareness was actually created, and as you rightly said, you know, in the 80s when I was practicing homeopathy, if I would go somewhere and say I'm a doctor, people would ask, you know, 500 questions. It still happens today, I call that curb consulting. You know, people take you on the corner and ask you, oh, today I've got a headache and what can you give for me and, you know, things like that. So I'm quite used to it because even when I'm flying, like I've done with you many times, there's always some call for distress or there's some pilot or some, you know, who puts a plane on autopilot and then comes and asks you, you know, I've got this problem, what can you do for me? So I think we are used to that. But having said that, I think at that time, when you then told people that you were homeopath, they would really turn away. So there was no financial status, there was no social status for homeopathy. Uh, it was not really a profession because it was followed by a lot of people who, were, who had read books and practiced homeopathy. Uh, it was, there was no kind of degree course that we did for five and a half years and then qualified. So lots of people read books, lots of people were retired and homeopathy actually came into the country, you know, uh, from the time of Maharaja Ranjit Singh. A French uh, doctor brought it here, you know, for his sore throat. And after that, it became very popular mainly as a, a charitable kind of treatment. I think among these 84 so, countries, France is most popular for using homeopathy? Yes, France is most popular, that's right. So it actually got popularity in India through free services. So it was very difficult to actually professionalize homeopathy. You know, when I started practice, uh, when I started my first entrepreneurship uh, in 82, 
and set up my first branded clinic, the, I had to borrow money at 36% per annum. And it took me 10 years to repay that. And at that time, you know, there were no mobile phones and nobody sent you an SMS saying, why don't you borrow money? Forget about homeopathy. Even medicine was not recognized as an industry. So people were not willing to, when I remember that I borrowed money for, you know, a big computer because I set up the world's first, you know, computerized clinic at that time when computers had just come into India. And I remember I had a big, you know, uh, you know, green colored thing which we used to call the evil eye because it was so big and we had to put a screen on it so our eyes didn't get bad. And I had a dot matrix printer which was the size of half this stage. And every time I took out a prescription, the whole building shook. You know, it was tuck, 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 it went on. So, and people said, you know, one and a half lakhs I had to borrow to, to buy that equipment. And they said, for 10,000 rupees, you can get a CA to run your business. And for 10,000 rupees, you can get an MD doctor at that time in the 80s to practice. And why are you going for technology which is wasted? But I think ultimately it was technology that helped me to grow. It helped me to uh, standardize things. And it gave me a model which then became very scalable because I was so dependent on technology. So it actually helped me out, I would say. So Dr. Batra, every doctor is a self-employed professional. But you converted yourself from a self-employed professional to an entrepreneur. When did the actual entrepreneurial journey begin after 1982? When did you start multiplying? I started multiplying in 1996. Uh, and it was all by accident. You know, fate is... So 1992 to 1996, you were a self-employed professional. Yes, 82 to 96, I was a self-employed professional. For 14 years, I ran, I ran a very successful practice, which was like a general practice. I used to see about 300 patients in a day and uh, in a very small place. And uh, I then gave that up at some stage and I then went into specialty practice, which was also around 1996. And my practice fell from 300 patients a day to two patients a week. But I enjoyed it very much because I spent a lot of time with my patients and I you know, uh, knew everything about them and their families. Uh, so it was a wonderful period, but around that time, a lot of things happened by accident. You know, like I said, my son was, you know, going to qualify as a doctor. I didn't have the money and I could never dream that I could buy property or real estate. Some of you must be, you know, real estate people over here. And, you know, I found that I couldn't, and you yourself, but, you know, even in, even in the 90s, I could not afford real estate in Mumbai and I couldn't think that I can, you know, uh, have money for my son to practice in Mumbai. So I went to Bangalore. And uh, my brother was that time in real estate, so I got a good deal and I set up a clinic for him with, you know, really a lot of love and care. I flew every weekend, I selected the marble, I selected everything, you know. And that came as a very fresh kind of a thing, people loved it. Uh, the Bangalore clinic did extremely well. And then that started the thing for a multi-city practice. So I would practice 20 days in Bombay and 10 days in Bangalore. So you were still a self-employed professional operating out of two locations? Exactly. Out of two locations, then it became three locations because I then started Mauritius. I mean, I remember when I went there and the clinic was already done, I had a partner there. And then I met the vice president to inaugurate and he said, you know, certainly you don't expect the vice president of a country to inaugurate a room. And really blew me off and said that homeopathy is not legalized in this country and if you try to practice it, I'll put you behind bars. And then, of course, I then treated the president, vice president, you know, <laughs> prime minister, ultimately. And within six months, they legalized homeopathy. Uh, we, you know, uh, passed a bill in parliament in favor of homeopathy. So then started the Mauritian practice and international practice as well. But for a long time, I was still, you know, operating from, like you said, a professional through multiple outlets. Uh, at some stage, I realized that, you know, as Shakespeare said, you know, the good is off interred with your bones. So at some stage, and I'd seen a lot of my f uh, friends' families who were very well-known doctors, that when they died and when they passed away, They've, I found that their children, you know, could not hold the practice. And if they didn't have children who became doctors, the practice actually died. It was something that is so personalized. I then thought that in 2000, I should set up a kind of a, uh, a corporate. And it was when, when I started actually thinking about it and took up a back office in the other and actually started with just two, three staff members. And then, you know, grew it from there. So it was a huge challenge because I still remember that at that time, you know, Agnello, people used to come to me and tell me, professional managers, okay, you know, you're a doctor, you've got a good practice. If your company doesn't run well, you'll go back to practice. What will happen to us? <laughs> so A, there was lack of confidence in the industry. B, there was lack of confidence in the person, that is me, who set up, a, you know, a, from a doctor trying to shift to an entrepreneur, was not well received by professional managers. And secondly, also that, 
you know, we lack the ability to deal with professional management. You know, as professionals, we have a very high standard, I would say, of, of dealing with people when everything has got to be exact. You know, medicine is something where you can't fail at all. You know, I always keep saying this, and it's very interesting for, you know, all of you to know, that one of the most exacting professions is actually being an actor. Because, you know, God sits in the box office every Friday. And if your film bombs, your price bombs. And if your film succeeds, then your price goes up. For a doctor, it's even worse than that. Because every patient is a box every office. Every patient is a box office. And every day you meet hundreds of box offices. And so you can't fail because every patient is an ambassador. So it's a very exacting science. And it's something which needs a lot of effort, you know, to make it happen. One point which we observed in this is that you practice for 14 years out of two clinics, one in Bangalore, one in Bombay. Yes. So in the around 41 years of practice, 45% of your time you're working as a self-employed person. And around 55% of the time, you establish this empire which uh, stretches more than 200 clinics, has gone international, you are present all across the country, you are present in Dubai, you are present in UK, you are present in Abu Dhabi, you are present in multiple locations. Yes. So how did this quick transition happen? I, I read about you where it said that you used to open two clinics in a year, till recently you started opening, in consecutive 10 days you opened up 10 clinics. How did no, that confidence no. come and no, how did it happen? Such speed. No, no, that happened, but uh, I mean, that's not actually true. So I just want to correct that. Uh, the entire company and the corporate life as an entrepreneur has only started 15 years ago. Like I said, we started in 2000, 2001, by the time we really established the company. And when we started, we used to open two clinics a year, which is right. And later on, we then, you know, we tried to benchmark actually, you know, we believe a lot of things that we do we benchmark with, comp not necessarily competition, because when you're the forerunner and there's nothing to benchmark, then whom do you benchmark against? So you benchmark not against other doctors, but you benchmark against other leaders in industry. So for example, what do we do? We say that if my front desk in my clinic takes 10 minutes to register, they will really get a firing. Why? Because when I go to Jet Airways, my registration is done in one minute or three minutes. If I go to Taj, my registration is done in one minute. So why should it be 10 minutes, you know? So operational excellence doesn't necessarily happen through the industry. It happens by benchmarking the best that is happening all over. And that's what we followed. So when you follow that, we try to follow the Axis Bank. If you remember some time ago, the Axis Bank had a very aggressive plan. One branch a day. One branch a day. So I said, can we do it? Let's try. And of course, we had neither the capital nor the resources to do that. But that's the time when we came close. We said, let's give it a shot, and let's see whether we can open one clinic. And we then opened one clinic in 10 days, but then again, we didn't open for many other days after that. So That's fine, but so, that 10 days was a record. But that was a record. We could do that. And even today, <laughs> uh, we still have a record because we now open for the last maybe four or five months, one new clinic every week. So from two clinics a year, we are now up to anywhere between six to eight clinics a month. So I'm sure, Dr. So, Batra, you can write a book on delegation because all this can happen only by delegation of authority and responsibility. How do you balance that? That's again not very easy because I think in order to delegate, you first need to trust. And in order to build trust, you first need to bring the right people on board. So I think a lot of time actually goes into selecting your CEOs, your group CEOs, your HODs. And I think if they are right and then Sometimes it takes a year or two years to actually mentor them. Because, you know, I always say that everybody's a profession. I mean, which is wonderful. They're very, very good as chartered accountants, as marketing, as, you know, HODs. But do they understand your business? That is very important. And therefore, I think to hone in professional managers into thinking as entrepreneurs, as business people, is where the challenge comes. Because if the person is still an HOD, but is going to work as a salaried person who's sitting in a, you know, big office, and he's just throwing his weight around, I mean, it doesn't help the company at all. So I think to convert, you know, professional people into entrepreneurs in their own small way is what is the challenge. And I think once you do that, and it took me almost two years to, to do that, once I did that, I could then trust and then I could delegate. And today I virtually sit, I mean, maybe four or five days in a month on just meetings and with my HODs. And rest of the time, I'm you know, free to paint and sing and dance and do whatever I want to do. And come here and talk to you. Excellent, excellent. I think uh, he, he is a gentleman who wears multiple hats. In the last 15 years, he has not only multiplied his business multifold more than 200 times, but he's also a singer. He's a great painter. He's a great photographer. 
He does a lot of charity work. He has got foundations in his, uh, with his company's name. He's doing some phenomenal work. What I would like to understand from you, Dr. Batra, is our success depends on the number of talented people we acquire. Individually, that talented person should be more talented than the business owner. But he needs to be under the control of the business owner. How do you manage that? And how do you do talent acquisition? Yeah, first of all, I don't believe in control. Control is not a good word. I believe in decontrol. When you are running large operations, you know, we've got all very small operations, but in multiple locations. So when you're doing that, then you have to decentralize. If you don't decentralize and you don't decontrol, you cannot grow. So my philosophy is just the opposite of control, is how quickly can you decontrol, how quickly can you decentralize, because that is how then you can grow very fast. When each branch and each clinic and each branch head starts thinking of himself as a profit head, that's when the change happens. If he's still going to be part of the whole, you know, somebody else is making money from him, somebody else. And just to, you know, address the point that you said about the foundation, you know, uh, I believe that I'm very passionate about it. And, you know, sometimes in some countries you have this 10% formula where out of every project you give me 10%. I have the 1% formula in my company. 1% of the profitability of the company goes to the foundation every year. 1% of employee salaries goes to the foundation every year. 1% of all the large projects that we do go to the foundation year. So the philosophy in the company, therefore... Even your vendors contribute 1%? Even the vendors. No, I mean, limited vendors contribute 1%. So the philosophy in the company, and this is what keeps me going, is that we create wealth to share wealth. And I think if you fantastic, have that philosophy... Fantastic. So I think uh, you are a very different type of thinking personality. So I'll ask you a different question. Sure. What was your first mover disadvantage? Rather first, than asking you the first mover advantage. Well, it's always a disadvantage. Because number one, it's, uh, there's no benchmark to follow, like I said earlier. Number two, uh, I mean, you can't copy anybody else. Everybody else can copy you. And so you've got so many, you know, stands up which come, standalone which come after that which have similar colors of blue and red. And unfortunately, intellectual property in India is still not very easy to, to manage. So you still have lots of breakaway groups who go and try to do the same thing. But I think we are able to deal with that in a major way. The one thing is that we are ahead in innovation at least by five years from anybody else. So by the time they catch up, we are five years ahead. So it really doesn't matter what they're doing. Because if you go to any other person who's broken away, he's doing what we did five years ago. And when you come to us, we're doing something new. So people know that, they appreciate that. So I think one way of making sure that you're always ahead of the curve, um, then it doesn't bother you. Uh, but otherwise, yes, I think it's a disadvantage because uh, it costs a lot of money to learn. You know, learning is very expensive. So your learning curves become financially and time-wise very long? Very long. <laughs> and it comes by experimentation. You know, I, I went to Harvard, my son, said, now you're 60 years old, you go to Harvard. I was one of the oldest students in Harvard. And I did a course in medical excellence. And one of the things I learned over there was that, you know, people in Harvard learn how to give failure parties, especially in the pharma industry. Because you fail early to succeed quickly. That's the philosophy. Fantastic. So I think you converted the disadvantage into one of your growth advantages. That's how, that's how you have achieved it. Dr. Batra, you are in a business model which is retail in nature, which is service oriented in nature. How do you handle the dissatisfaction of your patients? Because everybody can't be satisfied. Even if God becomes an entrepreneur and he starts giving services, there will be one component of the audience which will always be dissatisfied. How do you handle dissatisfaction? Again, a very difficult thing to do, particularly because you are in so many locations. Otherwise, it's not difficult. Uh, I would answer that question in three ways. One of it, of course, is you handle it through a process. Uh, we have a process, for example, for many, many years, we have an American company which goes as mystery customers. So everything about the clinic, how, he, how the doctor spoke and things like that, uh, what was the air conditioning, whether it was right or wrong, whether the toilets were clean, all of that comes back to us through a system. And it's very easy then for us, even without going to a clinic, to understand what is a consumer's perception. So mystery customer is one thing that helps us a lot. The second thing is that we've we, uh, you know, have also a system which is automated. Wherein, for example, if a doctor enters twice that the patient is not happy, provided he does it honestly, of course. You know, if he enters twice, if he doesn't have an ego problem and he says, you know, patient is not better. It comes into a central pool of talent 
uh, which is like a talent management pool. And so the top doctors out of the 400 doctors can actually vet that case and give their opinion. So again, this is process driven. So there's no need for anybody to complain because before you can complain, you get an answer, you know. Third, of course, we have other processes like, uh, you know, we have video conferencing free of charge. So if you're not happy with one doctor, you can free of charge, talk from Igatpuri to a doctor in Bombay or in London or in Dubai at no cost at all. So there are lots of things like this. And the latest that we started is we started, you know, when I was in San Francisco, like I said, I always learn from my traveling and where I go. Uh, you know, I found this, uh, the Uber model very, very interesting because I said, wow, this is so great. On your mobile phone, you can, you know, get a cab and it's so convenient and it goes to my, you know, mobile wallet. Yeah. And, your destination. And my mobile wallet and then I can rate my, you know. So I tried to follow that and it's taken us about a year to do that. So we now have a mobile app which actually allows you as a consumer to come into the clinic and rate the doctor immediately and the services. And this app is live on all top management phones. So for example, now somebody's taken away my phone, I don't know who it is, but please keep it safely. <laughs> and you know, it, I have a mobile MIS and so has all top. And if I press on star rating, I will get the star rating of every doctor across the country. So the biggest enabler you of know. your growth is technology. You really uh, developed and deployed technology to the T. So do you understand technology or have you deployed people who understand technology? What have you done? Or you have made a combination of both? I think I first sourced the right people. And that's very important. I mean, and you learned on the way. No, and I taught them what needs to be done. <laughs> because they don't understand my business. So my CIO who heads is from Tata's, wonderful guy. And he's been with us for almost now seven, eight years. He's made all these you know, systems for us. But how does it affect our business? What is it that needs to be done as a doctor? What needs to be done from a consumer perspective as far as a patient is concerned? Would he understand that as an IT person? He would not. So I would. So the application is mine, and the technology is professional. So you have invested heavily in technology with deploys and make sure that the customers, these patients are comfortable, they're happy, the doctors are on track, the doctors are being monitored. You make sure that your system delivers all of those requirements that you're having as a business owner. That's including, what you've done. Including operation time. I can press a button and come to know how much time each doctor has spent with the patient. Wow, that, that, is, that is technology to the T. I, mean, I can tell you Fantastic. which clinic, which clinic, which patient is waiting right now. I can tell you what is the waiting time at, is it for the reception, is it for the medicine, is it for the consulting, you know, we have, and then we have an average waiting time all across the world. So it has to match that. So if a doctor, for example, spends less than 45 minutes with a patient first time and 20 minutes second time, he's automatically through a system pulled up. Real time. Fantastic. Not, not at the end of the month, you know, and like that, the waiting time today for a new patient on a weekend is about 10 minutes, but earlier it used to be almost three hours. So, fantastic, fantastic. So, you know, so the operational efficiency also gets determined through technology. What is the mechanism of st your patient feedback, the technology itself? And Tech what do you use the feedback for? Well, the feedback goes to the medical director, who's, you know, a lady who's with me for the last 20 years or so. Uh, she did her, you know, she's a gold medalist MD from London. And so she then with her doctors corrects it online. So if there's somebody who's not happy with the treatment, if somebody's not happy with the service, then there are separate service customer people to deal with that. And if somebody's not happy with the medical side, then there's a system, you know, I also have a medical board with some of the 20 top doctors in, in medical doctors in, in medical technology. And so there, that resource is also then pulled to help people. What is your knowledge acquisition mechanism for yourself, for your organization, for your doctors, everybody in the team? How do you acquire new and new and additional and add-on knowledge? See, first of all, we have a very interesting knowledge management system. And because we believe that medicine is all about knowledge. I mean, people are really paying us, like any professional, for our knowledge. They're not really paying us for the treatment. It's like a lawyer. When you employ him, whether he wins or fails, you still pay his fees. So if somebody comes to an experienced doctor, he comes because he wants the right advice. And he wants the correct prescription. And that's what he's paid for. So knowledge is very important. And I think I realized this many years ago when I used to teach in London uh, in the City University. Uh, you know, I learned, I passed out in 74, like I said, 73 really. So 74, I started my practice. In 73, there was never any disease like chikungunya. I never learned about AIDS in medical college. I mean, I never learned about bird flu, avian flu. When I was teaching in, in the 90s, in, or in the 80s, sorry, mid 80s in London, there was a very interesting disease which was called Legionnaire's disease. I never heard of it ever. 
Now, Legionnaire's disease was respiratory failure. So many patients died in hospitals because of respiratory failure of infection that happened through air conditioning ducts. So, medicine is so outdated that if you don't keep up to it with it, I mean, you cannot treat people. I mean, today there are newer diseases. Today, half the diseases are antibiotic resistant because we are self-medicating ourselves, you know, and we are not even taking the right medicine. You know, earlier you used to do a throat swab, you used to find out what you're sensitive to and then take the antibiotic. So today, there's a huge generation of people who actually succumb to normal diseases because they can't be controlled because those drugs don't work for them, you know. So everything keeps changing and then there are new bacteria that are formed which are resistant. There are new diseases which keep coming up. So knowledge in medicine has to be totally updated. And it's a continuous process. It's, it's a, a continuous, continuous process. Yeah. How do you so, motivate and how do you interact with your top management? Because now it's more of a business for you than medical practice. You yourself might not be practicing very often. You're dependent on the team that you have deployed. So how do you motivate your top management and ensure that the business is driving towards the desired goal? By a review process. We have something which is called a management review process, you know, MRM, which we call. And that's once a month. And again, through technology, we can correct through all the 220 clinics at one time, and we can talk to them and review them. And everything is on an MIS, so you see what's happening. So basically, it's a, it's a review process. A lot of it also has to do with personal interactions on and off, uh, because I think the aim is to self-motivate people, especially the top management. And the second aim is, which is easy to do, because I'm saying at least you meet those people. So when you meet them and you talk to them, they do get motivated, and then they are self-motivated. The problem is, how do you pass it down to the last mile? That's always a challenge. So how do you know that whether your housekeeper, or your watchman, or your dispenser, or your compounder, or your technician, is equally, you know, gung-ho about the brand? And does he represent it on the floor when he's meeting people? I think that's always a challenge. And I think we have a lot of training imparted in medicine. We have what is called CME, which is Continued Medical Education. If the normal is about 30 hours, we do about 100 hours every, you know, every month. So, which means that in a year, three months, my doctors are not in active practice. They are doing either some research, or they are learning, or they are part of a training program, you know, because also they also, you know, honestly, they also get fed up seeing thousands and thousands of people. My clinic sees, uh, you know, about 15 lakh patients. And we treat about one and one lakh seventy-five thousand patients every month. Wow! Uh, we see more than what AIMS sees. AIMS sees about six thousand patients on a weekend. We see seven thousand patients every day on a weekend. Wow! So that's huge. So that's, that's huge. huge. And I think uh, for the work that is done for so many patients, the government of India has also given a Padma Shri. So is Padma Shri Dr. Mukesh Batra. So it's a it's a real pride for us. Well, thank Dr. you, Dr. Batra. Much. It's a real pride for uh, pride for us. And you'll also be very surprised to know that these days he is getting awards like the way we get newspapers at home. Almost every day is getting an award and being recognized in some part of the world. That again makes us feel very proud since we know you personally. That's amazing uh, returns for the effort investment that you have done in this country. We are very proud of those achievements. Dr. Batra, what triggered this growth? After 14 years of personal professional practice, what was that trigger which put you onto the growth path? It was just building a model which is replicable and which could be scalable. So a sustainable and rep replicable model with which I struggled for first few years to get. And once I could master it, today I'm saying there's, I really don't need to go to any clinic. I mean, all clinics that open, they open independently. The operation is done independently. The doctor's choice is also done independently. So everything is now through a process and system. I think a lot of effort goes now into our new businesses. A few years ago, we started the product business. We are today in 10,000 outlets. We have 50 natural products. And we are now competing with multinational companies. It's a huge challenge. So a lot of my time goes in new businesses. We also acquired a pet care hospital in Delhi, South Delhi. So we have an animal hospital which treats uh, dogs, cats. We have surgeries plus we have homeopathy. This is the, for there. the first time I heard in my life, a homeopathic treatment for animals. That was again started by Dr. Mukesh Batra. It's yeah. out, of the out of the box thinking. Yeah, we started I don't think so anybody time. else does it. Does anybody no, else no, do nobody it? Nobody else does it. It's, it's done in UK, but uh, in India, we are the first ones to do it. And also we have got you know, three daycare pet clinics, one in Gurgaon and one in uh, Goa and one in Vasai as well in Bombay, which is a daycare pet clinic, which also gives homeopathy and, you know, grooming and everything else. So we did that as well. Then we have started a media company where we take out a magazine and write some books uh, every month. So that's another, you know, thing which takes up a lot it of time. It reaches to two lakh people, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. It reaches to two yeah, lakh people. Yeah. 
Dr. Batra, I have studied your business model in depth for three hours. I really know. <laughs> I really know the in and out of it now. You probably know more about it than I do. Maybe I should ask you for advice <laughs> <laughs> on what I could do better. So uh, <laughs> what I want to ask is, this is phenomenal strategic planning. From practicing to multiplication through delegation uh, to uh, supplying uh, medicines over the counter uh, to uh, setting up foundations and doing great charity work to writing books to starting uh, college degrees in uh, in uh, uh, in collaboration with the Mumbai University. Yes, that's the academy. That to, is something. Uh, that, yeah. To running this academy, you are doing so many phenomenal things. Who is your strategic planner apart from you? All my co-team. This is strategy. Friend. This is nothing but this is strategy. I mean, I have a co-team. I don't know whether they're here. Ask them to come. They also probably stuck in traffic. <laughs> and so, you know. They are strategically late. No, they are always on time. They wanted to time. skip this question. No, they are always on time and they are responsible for, a strat for, for growing the strategy. I think we put our heads together and as a team we try to find answers. How many such heads do you have? We have about seven of them. I want to have two more to make them nine. Like they say, the Navratan is very important. <laughs> so I want to have two more. But today I have a strategic person who was earlier in Accenture in Gurgaon. I have a group CEO who was heading one of the verticals of Colgate. You have a Marico ex Marico guy India. also. I had an ex Marico guy who's not no longer there. But, but he, he helped to set up the plant. He really took operation. you to many places over the counter sales. No, he took us to uh, operational excellence in the products. He set the up Colgate the factory. Guy, the Colgate guy took you to the, the Colgate guy took us to the OTC route because that was his experience. So, so every person who comes and who's with us then helps us to. So, get how some does ideas your so. business model work for you, Dr. Batra? Is it your idea which is implemented by your team, or is it your team's idea which you get it implemented? Which way does it work? It's both ways. And I think most of the times? 50-50, to that's be honest. That's a diplomatic answer. <laughs> no, that's, I think that's, that's the true answer because they would back it if they were here. But that's the true answer because I think uh, when you're professional managers, I think as an owner, the first thing to do is to learn from them. And I think if you lose the capacity to learn from your professional managers, you've lost a lot of goodness. So like I said, they, have, they come with so much of wealth of knowledge, why would we not utilize it? The question is, how do we apply that knowledge to our business? That's what is important. And that's the only change that needs to be done. So, you know, they come with a lot of ideas. So can we adopt some of those ideas? Can we absorb them? That's all that we have to do. And similarly, then we have some dreams and, you know, I mean, I, you know, still feel, you know, like it was Sir Robert Frost who said, you know, that the woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have many promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep, yeah. you know. Super, super. So I feel that, you know, as you said, 86 countries where homeopathy is now recognized. We are today only in five countries. So I still have to capture another 81 countries. I have a long way to go. So in India, I may have, you know, done 130 <laughs> cities and I have covered every city which has got more than one lakh population. But I haven't covered so many countries yet. So even countries like Luthania and wherever, whatever, you know, you have on the map, why should I not get there? What, so have we learned, way to go. what have you learned from globalization and how did you apply it to your business? Globalization is a big challenge. And it doesn't work the way you want it to work. I mean, that's my lesson. And, you know, I failed many times in everything that I did abroad. Because the cultures are different, the laws are different. Uh, the regulation for health and food is the strictest out of any industry. So, for example, in Dubai, when we started, in for first three years, we lost a lot of money. Uh, we started in Dubai Healthcare City. We were the only Indian company there. We still are. Today, it's the largest turnover clinic of ours in the world as a single clinic. You know, we get something like 300 patients a day on a weekend, you know, in Dubai, where homopathy was not well known when we started. So it takes time. It's a huge challenge. Then also, you know, understanding people is a challenge. Uh, when I set up my second clinic, you know, the law said you have to have your operations in place. You have to have your... HR in place, so I paid for doctors, staff, you know, operational setup, everything, invested money. I got my license after 22 months. So for two years, I paid the, and the average time for any such international clinic is about six months to get a license. So you are not fearful of the gestation period of trying a new territory. You're not fearful of that. It's, you invest in that. It's part of the, I mean, if you go with an open mind and you say that, yeah, this is what I have to do. I mean, it's part of the game. And you know, there are no easy returns. You have to invest and you have to wait. And once you do it, then you get multifolds. I'm saying, I'm still looking at when we just opened a second clinic in Wembley after one in Harley Street in London. 
And I'm saying he should do so well today and started doing, you know, showing great signs of promise. I'm saying I keep thinking that, you know, it is 100 rupees to a pound. So, I mean, I'll make more money then than what I make, uh, you know, through, through, 10, uh, through 100 clinics in India. So, 100 clinics in India, successful, is equal to one successful clinic in London. So, all right, I have to wait for five years and I have to wait for six years and I have to experiment and I have to try. But in the end, it's worth it. You have to find an answer. Like I said, people who lose are people who give up. And I've never given up in my life. Fantastic. I'm sure the story it. says that. Your story says that. It is always known to a patient, including all of us. We have been patients with various doctors for various ailments. It is said that most of the times the treatment happens because of the way you are handled by the doctor. It's secondary is the medicine, but first is how the doctor treats you. You are in multiple locations. Culturally, the people are different. Yes. India is a world in a country. Yes. The Bangalore people will react separate yes. differently. The Gujarat people will uh, react differently. You are into multiple nationalities. The Arabs will react differently. The Europeans will react differently. How do you prepare your doctors mentally to handle these challenges? Because this is not medical. This is more of psychology. So how do you handle them differently? And how do you train them to accept that uh, change? See, the first thing is answer to your question is if you can be a doctor and you can be successful, I think you can be successful in anything else in life. Why I say this is because a doctor is all the time fighting death. And when you fight death or disease, ultimately you're going to lose because no human being lives forever. So when you can fight the impossible and yet succeed by giving people a good quality of human life, then you can fight anything else. And I think all my doctors are trained. I just want to tell you that every doctor who joins the company first undergoes a psychometric analysis. This has been happening for the last 15 years. They have a very extensive, because I believe that a person may be clinically very good. They all appear for MD level exams. The papers are set by MD doctors. The correction is done by MDs. And after they pass, and normally let me tell you, 3% of everybody applies to Dr. Batra passes. So if 100 people apply, three will pass the exam. After that, they may be good clinically. They may be very good academically. But are they good in people relationship? So that is where we do a psychometric test to understand whether they are people friendly, what role will they, you know, we have different roles in the company. So for example, there are doctors who look after patients for the next four or five years. You know, they have to be very stable, they have to be very emotive, you know. There are others who deal with new people. So they have to be very gregarious, very friendly. So all these roles are then given depending on the psychometric analysis. So they are not put out in the, into the market, you know, to use a very loose term, just like that. They're not like cannonballs who are just there and, you know, go around. A lot of research is done, a lot of planning is done, a lot of training is done before they go. And then a lot of them learn also hands-on. I'm saying, you know, if, if you are cultured, then you know how to deal with all cultures. If you are not cultured, then you find any culture difficult to deal with. So if you are trained well in how to deal with people, it makes no difference. Yes, different have, people have different needs and people have different customs. Like, for example, you know, I would say that, like when I went to, to Dubai first time, I had somebody who was looking after customer care. She worked in a hospital before. And I went to shake her hand and she said, sorry, sir, I can't shake your hand. Now, I understand that that's a custom. I mean, today when I have my, even my doctors, you know, they wear the hijab and they come to work. So there's nothing wrong in it. I mean, even today in Dubai, all our clinics have got two separate, by law, they have to have a separate women's waiting room and a separate gents waiting room. And they have to have a separate women's toilet. Otherwise, you can't get an operating license. So we follow all these things. I mean, it has to have a prayer room which faces Mecca. So these are all things which are local culture. So you learn from that. So you develop yeah. localization in every clinic where you operate. It is Bangalore, it is uh, Delhi, it is Punjab, or it is Dubai. It doesn't matter. Yeah, you have to because I think, you see, certain also diseases are endemic. Which, so other than people, people being endemic is one thing. Like a South Indian has a different eating habit and a different personality as compared to a North Indian. It's totally different lifestyle. So do you analyze the symptoms of what happens where most of the times? Yes, of course. You analyze that? Yeah, not only technology. that. technology. Not only that, even diseases are prevalent. Like for example, Bangalore, we have seen some of the worst cases of, skin, of skin allergy. You okay. know, Pathenium allergy in, in Pune again. I mean, fair people turn totally dark because of skin allergy. So like that. So you get always, you know, when I was in Mauritius, I came across the largest number of deaths in young people, suicides. Why? Because there was no college, they had to appear for, in fifth standard, they had to go to high school. And that was a competitive exam. And there was so much of parental pressure because if you become, you became a school dropout in the fifth standard, not in the tenth standard or twelfth standard like how it is here. So you became a dropout, you had no chance to go to higher education at that time. 
So, so many young people. Now, you would think Mauritius, oh, you go for a holiday. How beautiful it is. But you know that the weather changes in Mauritius from one kilometer to another. Here it is very cold and there it is very hot. Here you are on a height and you are, you know. So, again, it's, it's very, very common for allergies. So, things like, you know, again, when there's a small society, like Mauritian, you know. I mean, when I meet, went to meet the president, I mean, I found people coming and saying, you know, sir, mere ghar mein pani nahi aa and I said, how can the president be, you know, the prime minister, sorry, not the president, that was at the time. I said, how can he be, you know, bothered about such things? But when there's a gregarious, close society, then lots of personal problems also come out very easily. When you're in a large city like Bombay, your neighbor doesn't know what you're doing. And he doesn't even care. But when you're living in a small society with people like that, then the social pressures are so high that it then gives rise to depression. So there are so many cases of depression in Mauritius, which I saw which I would never believe in such an idyllic country with such beautiful beaches and such a happy kind of outlook would ever be there. So every country, every city has its own learning. Dr. Batra, you have got presidents, prime ministers, heads of states, political leaders, film stars, cricketers, name them, they are all your patients. How do you manage your stress of handling them? Because yeah. if a treatment to a president or a head of a state goes wrong, he'll ensure you are going to be uncomfortable for some time. How do well, you manage that stress? So far, I've been lucky. <laughs> and God is with me. Like they say, the force is with you, so that's good. But uh, yeah, it is stressful sometimes. But like I said, you know, we treat 1,75,000 people, out of which at least 10% of the people that we treat are like, you know, the top everywhere where we go. And uh, I think it's not a stress because, you know, first of all, I enjoy meeting people. And I mean, I've seen that whether you're treating a top industrialist or a top uh, you know, politician or a top film star, whatever it is, ultimately they are people. And they all have people needs. So, and a lot of them are isolated because they're living in an ivory tower. So they also want to meet and talk to people whom they can interact with. So it's wonderful to talk to people like that, nice to know them. I mean, I would say without exception, almost all the top people that I've met and treated have been extremely good people. And irrespective of whatever may be the imaging that you may have read in the newspaper or in the media or whatever was built, but, I mean, as they say, to your doctor and chartered accountant, everybody's nice. <laughs> so really, there's no issue on that. And also, I think if you're, if you're confident about, your well, about yourself, you know that you'll get good results. And then you know you tried your best, you know. I mean, I think it's a very valid point because, you know, you should know, for example, if you're treating the prime minister of a country, then even the medicine gets tasted by, you know, the tasters. Because how do you know what you're giving? Uh, you know, so you give the same medicine to both or this is just no, a... No, that they do internally. We have, no, <laughs> we, are not, we have no idea. We have no idea. And again, every, and then every prime minister or president has a own medical board. So normally when you have to treat somebody like that, you're not, you can't directly deal with the person. I have, I have to deal with the medical board. So there are 12 top specialists, for example, who are looking after the president or the prime minister. And I have to convince them that he must take this medicine. And of course, he must also convince them that he's my And doctor. they take the same medicine and without so, having the same illness. No, they take different medicines for, for different For testing. <laughs> no, no, testing is different. That's uh, done at a separate level. Well, uh, Dr. But, Batra, I, I cannot ask you a question on competition because in India, you're like the Indian Kabaddi team. India is the world champion in Kabaddi because no other country plays Kabaddi. <laughs> so in India, you have got no competition. What happens when you face international competition? Like France practices homeopathy. A lot of European company, uh, countries practice homeopathy, UK practices homeopathy. How do you compete international players? I think the answer is simple. If you follow excellence wherever you go, you don't have to worry about competition. And I think people always appreciate that. So if you do things the way you always did, and if you do it the right way and you're process driven and everything is, you know, uh, process and person driven, wherever you go, I don't think you should worry about competition. Because let me tell you one thing. You know, I just came from London last week. You know, I met you at the airport, I remember. And we were chatting. And that's how this talk actually came across. So we owe, you know, uh, a flight to this. And we have to thank that, you know, the fact that we fly together, you know, uh, you know to this wonderful evening that we are spending together. Couple of so, times our award receiving ceremony is also matched. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to match our bank balances also. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't mind changing that. So, <laughs> anytime. <laughs> you know. So I was saying that, you don't fear competition. You, no, you competition is, lead your own uh, route. Yeah, you, you lead the way. 
And in I, 1970s, and, and, and like I'm always saying that also, you know, I want to just mention that what I've seen with all my travel is that we are giving an alternative system of medicine to people who are used to it in their country. So even today, while almost now 20% of our patients are also foreigners and all of that, but a lot of our patients even abroad are Indians. So we are actually going in localities where Indians live and we are giving them, for example, in London, I'm giving one pound a day treatment to all Indians, which is unbelievable. I mean, they can't get that kind of thing even in national health scheme. So I'm giving them a very cost-effective option. I think London has already recognized uh, homeopathy as a treatment and the NHS supports the homeopathy uh, repayments. Yes, they spend about five million pounds every year on it, which is now being questioned. But and the Queen and the royal family also takes homeopathic medicine. So yeah, it's it's oh, popular, but it's also that's the reason of her long health. So that's right. Yeah, more than hundred years. The yeah, the the Queen. She's mother, living long. Absolutely, no, no, I'm sure queen, it's homeopathy. I'm yeah, sure the, about yeah, that. Yeah, the Queen Mother, you know, actually used to carry a black box of homeopathic medicines wherever she went, and you know, she lived more than hundred years old. And the present queen also, you know, is... That's is, a great is, brand ambassador, actually, is, is for long, the sector. Is long live the queen. For the sector. So, so really, that's wonderful. Uh, Dr. Batra, in 1970s, you had a revenue of 150 rupees a month. Hmm. And I don't want to ask what it is today. How did you do finance management all these years? How did you manage your finances in terms of planning your growth, planning your uh, living, uh, planning your acquisitions, planning your international expansions? How did you do that? If I give you an answer, you're going to laugh. But that's true. I have no idea about finance. And I don't know from where the money comes and where the money goes. Dr. Batra, every honestly, man who has made big honestly, money gives this answer. No, honestly. It's an, and I'll tell, you, no, I'll tell you why. I want to tell you why. I've always followed... See, all my company, they have all grown through internal accruals. So the first thing is that I've always put my money where my mouth is. And I have no investor in my company. I have no shareholder in my company. I own my company 100% and I've held on to it for 15 years. And I'm not diluted even 1% of shareholding with anybody. So, and any time more money is required, I put it from my pocket. So, the answer is that I believe in myself. I believe that I can create more wealth than somebody else can for me. Which is why I will put money into my new business rather than anybody else's. And point number three is that like I said, I've, my entire company has grown through internal accruals. So, what is the model that I follow? And this is what I tell you that you laugh at. I follow the Raj Kapoor model. So, what did Raj Kapoor do? Every time he made a film, and it was successful, he made two more films. Every time he made a film, and it failed, for two years he made no films. So, I follow the same model. So, if I have a successful year, I open 35 clinics. If I have a bad year, I open 10 clinics. So, whatever money I have, I, I cut. I mean, I, I cut my, my cloth according to the length and whatever I can afford. Fantastic. It's that's as a, simple as that. That's a lovely, that's a lovely strategy, Dr. Batra. That's definitely a lovely strategy. And then I sleep So well. no finance management? Not required. Because you cut your cloth to what you can do. So you just grow. I mean, if you do well... How do you do your growth planning? Part of it strategized because um, a lot of it has also to do with market research. And it also has to do with the opportunities that are there. For example, now, homeopathy or alternative medicine all over the world today is a 55, 58,000 crore market. And it's growing 30% every year, 25 to 30% every year. Well, is pharma industry, uh, which is growing at 10%. So one thing is that you are in the right profession at the right time, which is very important. Then automatically go growth gets propelled, you know. I mean, if we can grow, say, in Europe, which is growing at 1%, and if we can grow 20% in Europe, then, you know, we are doing better than anybody else. And the industry is doing better and we are doing better as a company. So, one thing is that you have to be in the right industry at the right time. And therefore, identifying that, like for example, now there's a huge move towards OTC products which are na nature-based. So, which is why we've invested in natural products. And today we are very small, we have about 250 outlets in Dubai and 10,000 outlets in India. But in the next two years, we will be in 100,000 outlets and you will find us in every shelf I mean, even today we are there in most of the modern trade, but you'll find us every there. So the idea is that you, so there's a market research. Now again, out of 10,000 products that are there, we are only picked on 10 or 15 products. So we are, for example, we are now challenging the face wash industry. We are saying that we've now made five, six different variants of face wash. We are challenging the shampoo and the, you know, the soap industry also. Even the hair growth industry. The hair growth, of course, that's a separate, that we are leaders in anyway. So that I'm not touching, but I'm talking about an OTC, 
you know, product. So we select where we think we can make an impact. And also, whether do we want to have a small market like homeopathy? Or do we want to get into a wellness market which is much larger? So do we want to have a large pie of a small market? Or do we want to have a small pie of a large market? So we look at that. And sometimes it's better to have a small pie of a large market rather than to have a large pie of a small market. Fantastic. And so based on that, like for example, today in homeopathy, we actually own 40% of market share of organized homeopathy in India. Wow, 40%. that's large. Yeah, but in terms of revenue, it's very small. So when you compare this with say 90,000 crores, which is hair care products selling in India today. I think homeopathy industry is 5,750 crores in India. Correct. So if we can get to a larger 90,000 crore and get 1% of that, uh, you know, we are happier. So, so that's what we are looking at. So I think a lot of the strategy that is built on growth is built on market research. It is built on our insight into understanding of people. A lot of it has also got to do with cultural uh, ways, the way people are changing. Like for example, at one time, everybody used to oil hair, but today people don't like to oil hair. So therefore, the, the non-sticky hair oil today does well, rather than the oily hair oil. So we, are now, so we have a non-sticky hair oil. So I'm saying understanding consumer insight and understanding consumer behavior and understanding cultural changes in people and then looking at the market size and then developing it. That's what... So you've been modest by saying that you have to be at the right time, at the right place in the right industry. I think you were in an industry and you made it right through your efforts, through swimming against the tide and today you're successful in that line of business. Uh, before I pass it on to the audience to ask questions, one last question. Can you tell us two strategies which work the best for you in the retail industry? You're into retail, you're spread across geographically, internationally, you're well spread. What are the two most successful uh, strategies that you adopted, implemented and were successful? One was no credit. We challenged the entire, we are the only company in India today which does not give goods on credit. Everybody gives on consignment basis. We don't give it. You take it and you have to sell it. And we challenge the industry. And in spite of that, we have 5% of market share in some of the products in some of the outlets in modern trade. So we challenge status quo and we set our own rules and we fought for it and we build that. Fantastic. So what is the second strategy? In terms of... Successful strategy which you implemented and made you successful. Well, the second, like I already said that, is technology and people. I'm saying if you invest in technology the right way, and you use it to scale up because uh, that's what, you know, we use SaaS, we use SAP. We are one of the smallest companies perhaps which use SAP. It's one of the smallest companies to use SaaS. So you can actually do predictive buying for our customers, you know, things like that. So if you use technology uh, and if you use people well, because ultimately you're in a service industry and therefore, uh, you know, getting your people right is very important. Which is that one sweet failure which still gives you nightmares? Nothing at all. I sleep very well. <laughs> then you must have forgotten that failure. So which is one failure you remember? Never remember any failure. You know, failures are stepping stones to success. Can you and share one? Many. I failed all the time in my life. I am one of the world's biggest failures who finally became successful. Fantastic. Fantastic. So friends, that is Dr. Mukesh Batra. And uh, let us have the audience asking questions. We'll have some questions, rapid question asking session now, starting with Vivek Mendonca. Yeah, Vivek. Good evening. Uh, doctor, out of all the clinics across the globe, most of them, 99% are franchise, right? No. How did you get that idea? Because Lawrence and Moore franchises. No, no, we don't <laughs> franchise at all. <laughs> so neither do I. Yes, you do. Good evening, doctor. I am Siddharth Bimani. Uh, Hi, Siddharth. Hi. <laughs> Uh, my question is that uh, all your CEOs, uh, some are from Accenture, some are from Colgate. So is it a strategy to have uh, people from uh, cross field or it's just because there are less number of doctors into management? There are not less number of doctors into management. That's a trend now. Just like IS officers, you know, I mean, lots of doctors today are going into IS and IFS and everything else. So doctors are also into management. But like I said, let doctors practice medicine well and let professional managers do profession well. I think that's what I believe in. So it's nothing to do with either Colgate or Accenture. It's just finding the right person. So irrespective of which industry comes, it makes no difference. So it's not a strategic plan that I should have taken somebody from Tata's and I don't have a thing in my mind 
a kida in my mind that tells me that I must only pick up these are the top five companies and I must have somebody, you know, on my board or somebody on my, uh, in my, you know, group from them. That's not true. You it's, pick up as per your requirement. Yeah, it's purely as per, no, as per, the mem as per the merit of the person, that's all. Irrespective of what the background is. You cut off the stress from your life by just letting it pass off. And the name of his clinic when, uh, he, when he started was Positive Health Clinic, right? Yes, yes. So, it is not only in the name, but it is also your belief in your mindset. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, Mrs. Shivera. <coughs> Good evening, doctor. During the conversation, you told that uh, India is very bad in property intellectual rights. Now, in case of homeopathy, you being the leader, how worst are other countries just like India? Well, other countries are pretty good, except that the cost of litigation is still very high. <laughs> so sometimes, again, you know, as I said in the earlier question, better to let go. I mean, ultimately, do you want to pay your lawyers more money than, uh, you know, what you would gain otherwise? So yes, it is protected abroad, far greater than what it is in India. But uh, the cost of litigation is very high, and the process is as tedious. I'm saying a lot of people who think that, you know, India is very difficult. Let me tell you, India is actually a very easy place to do business in, in spite of all the problems that we have. I mean, abroad is more difficult because the laws are so stringent. I mean, there are so many, you know, sudden people who come in, all your processes have to be perfect, even if you're slightly, you know, a little bit, I mean, a, a, a colleague of mine not working with us, but another homeopath, I mean, she was fined some 15,000 dirham because they found a toothbrush in her drawer. And she said, you can't put a toothbrush, it's unhygienic, it has to be in the toilet. That's it. So, you know, the laws are very difficult and sometimes to, uh, to fight that and to do litigation, even for intellectual property, is very expensive and not worth it. But, but if you're a large company, I'm saying, I mean, you should still do it. And even though the cost of cartage and all is much higher, but we insist, so even a franchisee cannot buy medicines locally. So the quality of medicines is maintained all through. And that is also with the packing material. So that's one. Let me answer first. <laughs> then you can ask another one. You're free to answer. The night is still young. I have no flight to cash today. So don't worry. Yeah, Dr. Salim. Good evening, sir. As you said, you are always ahead five years than your competition. Can you just give us an example in your uh, business, like any example, how you be five years ahead than I'm saying you know, that will be a, a very long after after dinner conversation, okay. <laughs> and it'll never end. Okay. But just to give you an idea, we started blister packing of medicines in 1982, when nobody in the profession had done it. And that was again because of patient compliance. Patient compliance was a huge problem. So we wanted to make sure that patients could take just one little thing, put it in their pocket and take the medicine wherever they went. So we cracked that patient compliance problem by blister packing, also the fact that it was untouched by hand and convenience. So we added convenience to safety for our patients because you know homeopathy is very safe. So we added convenience as well. You don't have to take a kada, you don't have to take something bitter. You can carry it wherever you go, very easy. So that was one example I'm giving you. Like that, we started telemedicine before nobody had done. We started the first, we, are, we started, are you a medical doctor, sir? Okay. So you know that there's only one company which started an IT case history, electronic case history in the world, and that is Intermountain Inter Hospital. We are the second in the world to start an electronic case history. Even today, 25-year-old cases are kept with us. Not only cases, but all your medical records. You have never to bring your record a second time. Everything is on a system. And that system is connected with all the 220 clinics. And I can look at it live on my phone. So tell me which other companies done that. So I think that's your answer. I mean, I can go on and on. But there so are that's many a long way ahead of any competition. Yeah. Good evening, doctor. Thank you for unraveling the enigma of Dr. Mukesh Batra. I just had wanted to ask you a very simple question. What about succession planning in the way ahead? I think nobody knows the future and I think, like I said, one of the biggest ideas was that it should become independent and be run by professionals. And that's the move today, that's what we are trying. Having said that, like I also told you earlier, my son is a homeopath, he's now the vice chairman of the company and he's the MD. So he's actually sitting in the driver's seat and takes all the decisions today. So day to day running is done by him, I just do the strategy and just raise a few questions every now and then like all good chairmen should raise, that's all. So, you know, uh, I think that should answer your question because it's taken, you know, like I said, also with top CEOs, I spend a lot of time in mentoring them into making sure that they follow the values of the company, which are very important for me. 
you know, and the direction and the strategy. And I think if that is followed, then automatically it becomes independent. Fantastic. One last question, Swati. So you must be having research team for that and uh, new medicines are also coming. So uh, how do you train all the doctors in all the branches? Do you have any specific training program or? Uh... Yeah, I just mentioned that we have what is called a CME, which is a continuous medical education program. Some of the best doctors from all over the world come. Earlier, we used to do it personally in different outlets. Today, we are all connected through video conferencing and you know everything is live. So it's much easier now. Uh, so that's one answer. The second answer is that, you know, just now we had swine flu and we, did, we gave about 9,000 doses to patients all across the country free of charge, our patients, and not a single one of them developed swine flu. And that's the research that we did with one homeopathic medicine. And I was very happy with my period as a doctor as well. You know, as a doctor, I had to reach out to people. I helped a lot of people. I healed people, changed lives. It was very satisfying. But honestly, it took a lot out of me. It actually killed me in many ways. Because every patient who comes picks a piece of you. Physically, emotionally, in terms of time. I mean, I've held hands of young women at three in the morning because their kid had high fever. Because, you know, that's how you build up a practice. So it's very taxing. So being professional was rewarding but taxing. Being an entrepreneur is rewarding in some way because we have a good lifestyle, we have enough time to enjoy what you're doing. But it also gives you time then to, to, to do whatever you missed all your life. I learned how to sing when I was 58 years old. I started singing. So I, I learned how to sing when I was 54. I learned how to you know, do photography at 54, sing at 58. I learned how to swim at 63. Wow. So all this I wouldn't have done if I, was a, if I was in practice because I would be swarmed with people. And you know, there the concern is not for yourself, it's for other people. So I think entrepreneurship has given me the time to be myself and to enjoy my life a little bit, which I missed as a doctor. So your pick is the entrepreneur. I think with that, uh, we have come to the conclusion of this subject and let's all give a loud round of applause. Thank you very much. Mr. Vasan Doble and Rehman Bhai to come up on stage, please. Dr. Batra, this is a memento from Inspiring Conversations. I would like to request Dada Karasgi to please come up on stage.